so don't have your title. I'm sorry. No advertise. Okay, so I. Okay, so it's lax of me not to advertise the talk, um, for which I apologise. So this is a physicist's take on the conjecture of, of Birch and uh, Swinnerton Dyer. Um, before I start, perhaps I should make a couple of remarks as to why um, I'm interested, but perhaps even before I do that, I should say that this is a, a, a long, ongoing project with Zenia de la Osa, and uh, there are people here who've been very kind to us over the years, among them Fernando Rodriguez, um, who have listened patiently to our muddled thoughts on this, and uh, Don Zagier has also been very good to listen to us to parts of this over the years, and uh, Roger Heath-Brown, latterly, uh, in Oxford. So, um, the point of, of, of thinking about this, of course, is that it would be wonderful to gain some insight into the conjecture of Birch and Swinnerton Dyer. But the other thing is that if you think about it for a bit, you realize that there are processes in here which are very similar to processes familiar to physicists. That's our particular uh, interest. Um, and so it's an interesting point. We don't know whether these processes are similar because perhaps there are only so many processes and uh, physicists and number theorists uh, use the same methods, perhaps because there are only so many methods. Or perhaps, more interestingly, there might well be a deeper connection. So that's the, the point of interest. Of course, when you say that physicists and mathematicians use the same methods, that's not immediately obvious because they use the same methods in a rather different language. Okay, so one of the points of interest is to make contact between uh, these various methods and the different languages. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about uh, elliptic curves. So uh, I ought to define these. Um, but also, we'll be talking about elliptic curves, of course, over various number fields. And um, we're not going to get very far without considering Piadic numbers. Now, Xenia talked about Piadic numbers. Other people have talked about Piadic numbers, perhaps, uh, in the context of, of this conference and in the context of last week's um, last week's uh, school. Okay, but uh, roughly speaking, well, not roughly speaking. So, uh, a, a Piadic number XP is 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 is. Uh, Okay, so you start with a rational number. Given a rational number, um, or even better, start with an integer. If, uh, if you can write m is p to the n times m primed, then you say that the norm of m, the piadic norm of m, is p to the minus n. So the, the, the uh, words that go with that is that you say that a number is small, the more it's divisible by p. And starting with this, the, the, the remarkable thing is that, of course, this is a norm. It has the, the product properties of a, a norm, that the norm of a product is the product of the norms. And um, with this, you can define a number system. So uh, in the beginning, of course, there were the integers. The integers even perhaps before there was coffee. Um, and you think about the, 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 the uh, integers, and very soon you discover that there are rational numbers. And then something very subtle happens. Most people can remember the day that they decided that it was okay to think about the square root of minus one and go from the reals to the to the complex numbers, but people have forgotten the day that they decided that it was okay to think about the square root of two. That, that if you have a sequence of rational numbers, 
1.414 and so on, then those converge to a, 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 a definite number and it's okay to think about the square root of 2 as the limit of this sequence. Now, in fact, to construct the reals, you actually need a notion of Cauchy sequences, a notion that you can have a sequence of rational numbers that converges. So you also need the notion of a norm and that you can construct root 2 as the limit of a sequence of rational numbers as we do. Okay. If you take a different norm, then you complete the rational numbers in a different way and you go to the Piadic numbers and if you go this way, of course, you can add the square root of minus 1 and you get the complex numbers, which of course are fantastically useful. Um, if you go this way, you can complete these and you get the, an, an analog of the complex numbers, CP. And you can do this for every prime P and so you get the various completions of the rational numbers. And in what we'll discuss, it'll be very useful to talk about an Adele. So an Adele is, first of all, it's, it's a vector in which the first component is a real number and after that there's a piadic number for every p. So it's a vector labelled in which the first component is a real number and every following component is a piadic number for each prime p and you also make the technical assumption that except for a finite number, these piadic numbers are all in the piadic integers. Okay, piadic integer are the piadic numbers with, with norm less than or equal to 1. Okay, now we'll also talk about adic numbers. So you can think of Adele's this way or you can also think of them as pairs of numbers. where these are adic numbers or some people call them finite adels. And the point being that if you know a number by the Chinese remainder theorem, if you know a number mod 2 and you know about a number mod 3, then you know about the number mod 6. So you can combine these numbers together into a single number, the adic numbers, and one way of representing an adic number will be, I'm going to get the limits wrong. There are a certain finite number of negative terms. So k is 1 to k max. And then you'll have, there's conventionally a minus 1 to, to the m plus 1. So k plus 1. Bk over something like k minus 1 factorial and probably here we probably would take a 2 um, <coughs> so you can represent such a number this way and we have although we don't have a norm for the adic numbers we have a topology. You can say that two adic numbers are close together if their adic expansions agree up to some high order. Okay, so two numbers are close together if the difference is divisible by a lot of integers. Okay. And something that we'll need towards the end is it's obvious from this. I mean, the point is that this series in the adic topology, this series converges. Right. Um, it's, and you have only here a finite number of negative terms, so it's clear, in fact, that you can write any adic number as a rational number plus an adic integer, where an adic integer is the set of adic numbers that you can write this way. 
and that that is unique if naught less than r less than 1. Okay, so you can decompose an addict number into an ordinary rational number plus an addict integer in a unique way, and we'll need that later. Okay, let's see if we can make this work. Yes, so this is with joint work with Xenia. And then there's a slide for the top part of the slide is for the physicists. The physicists know too much, right? So if you start in physics, then you think you know what an elliptic curve is. Elliptic curve is a torus and you think of it as a bit of the complex plane where the complex numbers are defined, defined modulo 1 and modulo 2. So you think of it as this uh, rectangular region at the top of the slide. And one, inch, one pretty property, I can work this, one pretty property of a torus is that given two points, you can add them. So if you have a Z1 and a Z2 defined modulo 1, modulo 2. You can add them, you get a new Z, the sum, which is also defined modulo 1 and modulo 2. And so you, you have a group operation. You have two points in the torus. You can add them, you get another point on the torus. Okay. Now, the pretty point is that you can think of a torus, instead of thinking of it this way, defined over C, you can think of it this way, that it's given by a cubic equation in P2. So I've written it there in homogeneous coordinates. You can, um, let's take A and B to be rational here. If you take them to be rational, then by scaling you can clear denominators, take A and B to be integers. This is an important point for what the things that follow. Take A and B to be integers. And usually this equation is written in inhomogeneous form. You take Z is 1 in this equation, you write the equation this way. Um, if you do that, you're missing one point. So if you take Z equals 1, then of course you're missing the point where Z equals 0. Um, if Z is 0, then there's just one point in the curve, and that's when Y is 1. If you set Z is 0 in here, then Z appears there, there, there. You're forced to take X is 0, um, but you're not forced to take Y is 0. If Y is not 0, then it's 1, and so you're missing one point, which is the point at infinity, O. And so one thing you could do is you could consider E defined over Q, which is the set of all X and Y in this equation, where X and Y are both rational, and... Uh, you just add the point at infinity, which is this point, which is a rational point. Okay, so the pretty thing is that you can think of the elliptic curve as defined over the rationals, or indeed over a field. So you could think of the elliptic curve as defined over FP, the finite field with P elements, or you can think of it as defined over QP, the p adic numbers. Okay, and the group law persists in this context. So uh, the ability to add two points, Z1 and Z2, persists. It looks a bit different in this context. What you do is if you have a point P and Q, say P and Q are rational points, then the pretty thing is there's a rule for adding rational points which will give you another rational point. So the the uh, elliptic curve defined over the rationals is a group again. Um, and the addition law is this. You draw the line through P and Q. It gives you a point R. Um, R is not directly the sum because there's no notion of sign here. What the rule you have is that P, Q and R sum to zero. So, uh, but you get, uh, you get P plus Q by drawing the line through O which on this graph is the point at infinity. So the line, this vertical line goes through O. Um, you draw the line through O and R, and you get minus R, which is P plus Q. So if you have two rational points, you get a third. So you can start with some rational points and get more. Even if you have one rational point, P, then you can draw the tangent through P and by 
drawing the line through infinity again, you get a point that you're going to call 2p. So if you start with some rational points, you can make many more. Okay. So the first question that arises is, are there finitely many or infinitely many rational points? And the answer depends on the curve. So one difference between the way physicists and, and uh, number theorists think about elliptic curves is that physicists tend to think of things in families. We tend to, we know there's a one parameter family of elliptic curves if you define them over the complex numbers. In number theory, it's much more that the properties of each member of the family can be very different. So people concentrate, tend to concentrate more on individual members. Right. A given elliptic curve might have a finite number or an infinite number of points. There are examples of that. But if the number is infinite, then it's finitely generated. So if the number is infinite, then there's some number of points called um, that number, some number of linearly independent points, that number given by an integer called the rank, such that you can take a, 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 a point, a general rational point, and write it as a sum of a number of generators plus a point that's in torsion. So there's a, there's a torsion, there, there may be a torsion point such that m times a certain multiple of torsion returns you to the origin. Okay. This number, the rank, is a mysterious quantity. It's thought to be a mysterious quantity because there's no algorithm that will, with a finite, that's guaranteed to calculate the rank for you in a finite, num in a finite amount of time. Okay. Whereas the torsion part, this part here, is under fairly good control. You have the Lutz-Nagel theorem, which will find the torsion group for you in a, in a short amount of time. Okay, so the, the, as, a, an, as an abstract group, the, the elliptic curve, the, it consists of a torsion subgroup and then a lattice of rank R. And indeed, the, uh, the torsion groups are known. There are only a finite number of, of possible torsion groups, and these are listed here. Okay, and there's a simple and effective, given a curve, there's a simple and effective uh, calculation which will find the torsion group for you. Okay. We'll also need the notion of height. So if you have a rational point, say you have a rational point x, y, z on the elliptic curve in, in homogeneous coordinates, then you can remove denominators and think of it as a point given by three integers x, y, and z, and so you can have a real height, h infinity of this point, x, y, z, will be the max over i of the modulus of the x, i, thinking of the curves as, x, as the coordinates as x1, x2, x3, that way. Alternatively, you can define the height of a point over the piadics in a, in a similar way. So given piadic point, you can define the, the height as the maximum of the xi with respect to the piadic norm. And there's a, an embellishment of the height that's useful. There's an embellishment of the height that's useful, which is the canonical height, where you take basically the, the logarithm of this and embellish it a bit. I won't go into it. Um, and you can cook up a height which acts on the rational points as something that is bilinear in the points. It satisfies this rule at the top exactly. 
And given such a bilinear height, you can define a metric in the usual way that you get uh, a metric from a, from a, a quadratic norm. Um, and this is quadratic. And if you do this, you find that if T is torsion, that uh, T in this metric is orthogonal to all other points. Okay. okay, so the slides are a little bit out of order, perhaps, and we come to something else. We'll come back to the height in a minute. Um, and then there's the... They, I have to tell you about the Vey, Chatelet, and Tate Shavrevich groups because mainly because Shah comes into the story and we found Shah very painful to understand and it's only right that some of the pain should be transmitted to you if, it, if you're a physicist. Okay, so you have an elliptic curve, say y squared is x cubed plus ax plus b, and you can have other elliptic curves. So if you're working over the reals, say, this is an equivalent curve. You just change coordinates. You change coordinates by root 2, and you go from one to the other. So if you're working over the reals, these are the same elliptic curve, but if you're working over the rationals, then you're not allowed to change y by root 2, at least it's not the same curve. Okay. So there are curves which are the same if you work over Q algebraic, the algebraic maximal algebraic extension of Q, but not the same if you work over Q. And the set of such curves, which are the same if you work over Q algebraic, but not over Q, form a group. They're the Vey Chatelet group. And you can have a Vey Chatelet group over Q algebraic, or you could do it over QP algebraic, and so on. So you get a group for each of these extensions of Q. Now, we come to Sha which is that it's possible it's possible for there to be a curve such that the curve is equivalent to the given curve over the reals and it's equivalent to the given curve over QP for every P and yet it's not equivalent to the original curve over Q. Okay, and I think I've got that right. And these things form a subgroup of the Vey Chatelet group, and that's Sha, the Tate Shafarevich group. Okay. okay, you can think of these as. So this is a picture. You can think of the. Uh, the elliptic curve is a lattice, and the, uh, an element of the Vey Chatelet group will be a copy of that lattice, and, uh, but it's displaced by an irrational amount. Okay. I find this, this diagram helps me think of this as a group, because then you have another one which is displaced from this grayed out lattice by another irrational point, and so on, and you could see that these things would form a group. There's a, there, there are other better constructions. Okay. Okay, so now we come to actually the subject of the talk. So this is the BSD conjecture. And there are two ways of stating it. There's a sort of a, a, a brutish statement and a uh, sophisticated statement. Um, the the conject conjecture itself was, uh, is 50 odd years old, and so most people will have been brought up with these sophisticated statements. So let's start with that. 
and the sophisticated statement is phrased in terms of the L function. Okay. And it starts like this, that you have an L function for the curve is a function of S, and the statement is that the L function is an analytic function of S. You continue it to a uh, neighborhood of S equals 1. There it vanishes uh, to a certain order. That order is the rank of the group, so the first statement is that the order of vanishing of the L function is given by the rank of the group, and that there's a constant, there's a coefficient here, and the coefficient takes this form. Okay, so here we have pi infinity. Oh, that's something else I didn't say. So there's a, an invariant form. Everybody knows that on an elliptic curve, there's a form which is dx over y. Okay. This, if you think of the elliptic curve as over the complex, this was dz, this was the, the invariant form. Sorry, this was the holomorphic form on the torus. Um, it's often written as this form is important to us. Um, omega is uh, dx over y. It should really be dx over 2y. And it should really be z dx over y if you write it in homogeneous. Uh, have I done that correctly? Z dx No. Okay. Has to be homogeneous. No, 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 it's important, right? Right, right. Right. And something that's important and not generally realized is that if you write Zf, the function that gives you elliptic curve, this is z y squared minus x cubed minus a x z squared plus b z cubed, that omega is in fact z dx over df dy, and that's the that, in fact, is the general form, okay? Okay, so there's an invariant, in fact, this is, uh, this is epsilon ijk. Xi dxj over df dxk. This is something I could explain, but I won't. I, 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 I won't stop to explain, but this is important for things that come later. Okay, so there's an invariant form. There's a natural form, this object, and so you can integrate this over E of R. You can integrate it over the real cycle, and you get a period, pi infinity. Okay, so this is the pi infinity that appears here. This sha is the tate shafarevich group. This is the order of the tate shafarevich group. Um, this is the determinant of the inner product on the generators of the elliptic curve, and you divide here by the order of the torsion subgroup squared, and there is a factor that comes in the tamagama of the Tomogama numbers that come in and they correct a little bit for the primes of bad reduction. There are only a finite number of these and these are integers. I won't spend too much time talking about these. Okay, so this is the Birch, Swinnett and Dyer conjecture. Now, this started off life, as I said, in a coarser form and the point is that what the, the um, L function is a product of local factors here, and if you put S is 1, or if you take look at 1 over L of P to the minus 1, then this is N P over P, which N is the number of points of the curve over the finite field with P elements. 
And um, this number here is, in fact, something that you would associate more with physicists than with mathematicians. This is a, a regularized form of this product. Okay. This, the, this function uh, is defined by analytic continuation. Um, it, the, this product, if you define it through the L function, has a pole at S equals 1, corresponding to the fact that the product doesn't converge if you uh, multiply over all primes. Um, so it's a regularization of this product. But I actually, I prefer to work, or I prefer to work with divergent quantities. At least you get more of a hands-on feel for that. So um, there's a coarser statement of uh, the BSD conjecture that looks like this. It says if you take uh, NP over P, multiply over P for all primes less than some cutoff M, include these factors here, Sha and the uh, real period, then as m goes to infinity, this is asymptotic to log m to the r here. And this is the form in which uh, Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer originally made their, their conjecture. And there's a coefficient here which is related to the coefficient that appears here. There's a mysterious root 2, which I don't know how to explain. Um, and so you have this factor here. Okay. So it's in this last crude form. I mean, I hate to, hate, uh, it's bad to say crude because this is the way that the, the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer uh, originally, originally proposed it. I have a book on whitewater rafting, which is very good. Um, and it describes things. It says that the uh, sophisticated rafter takes this course down the, the rapid, and it says, and the uncouth rafter does things the other way. So it divides the world into sophisticates and people who are uncouth. So in this sense that uh, we're being uncouth, we're, we're doing this way. Okay. Okay. So, there's a, there, there, there's a, of course, if you can prove that, uh, the, 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 if you can prove that asymptotic equality, you've proved the birch swinnerton dyer conjecture. And there's a technique for tackling diff difficult problems, which is that you fiddle with one side of the equation, and you fiddle with the other side of the equation, and you hope that you meet somewhere in the middle. So, we're going to do that. Let's uh, start with the right-hand side. The right-hand side of the conjecture says this. And this looks, when, when it, you're presented with this, li this looks terribly complicated, right? It involves the torsion group and the inner product on the generators and the log M add to the R, with, and the R is supposed to be this, this rather uh, sophisticated and, and, and uh, uh, difficult uh, number. But in fact, it's something that we learned from Zagier. It's in a paper of Zagier's. Uh, I'm sure it goes back before, but we, we learned it from from uh, Zagier, that this number, this right-hand side, is just the square of the number of rational points. Okay, and the argument is very simple. Right? Suppose you want to count the number of rational points, that number will be infinite, so we put a cutoff, and so we count the number of points less than height, a certain height, one over epsilon, say. So you might be tempted to perform this sum. Okay, so now each point P can be expressed uniquely as a torsion point plus a sum of a number of generators. So the sum is, is exactly this. Um, the torsion comes out of the height. It doesn't contribute to the height at all. So that comes out and the sum over the torsion just gives you a factor of the um, torsion subgroup. And then this height just gives you this bilinear quantity in the ends. Epsilon is small, so this sum it can be approximated by an integral. I mean, that's exact to, to leading or asymptotic order. And so you get, e, you get a Gaussian integral here, and this is just e torsion over the determinant of the group, and then pi over epsilon to r over 2. So, in fact, you have to make a connection between 1 over epsilon and log m, but you see that this number, and this is very important, this is the most, in, this is the most surprising fact about the Bert Swinnerton Dyer conjecture, which is that the right hand side of the conjecture is not proportional to the number of rational points, but it's very clearly proportional to the rational number of rational points squared. 
Okay, you see clearly that you take this and you square it and you get that. Okay, so the right hand side of the conjecture is proportional to the number of rational points squared. Okay, oh, I don't, let's back up, right? So. Okay, so that's the, that's the, the, that's the uh, right hand side. Okay, then we look at the left-hand side of the conjecture. Can we say something about that? Okay, and well, some parts of it we can say something about. So I've just told you, well, that the, <coughs> the real period is the integral of this uh, invariant differential. That's the integral over here. It's a standard thing found in, in textbooks. I could prove it, but, but uh, it's a standard thing that this quantity here, CPNP over P, is uh, the integral of the one form or the Piadic analog of that over E of QP. So uh, the important thing is, is, is uh, that people haven't thought about it, is I didn't say this, but if you deal with uh, piadic numbers, you have a piadic norm. And once you have a norm, you have all the processes of analysis. So all these things that you enjoyed, if you're a physicist as an undergraduate, you know, limits and continuity and integrals and differentials and so on, all exist in the piadic context. And even analysis in the sense that physicists understand it, which is the ability to write down delta functions. Okay, so distribution theory, Fourier analysis, delta functions, all these things <coughs> exist, right? Though mysteriously, they're not found in books on piadic analysis. Okay, but all these things exist. And you can show, so this is a standard integral, right? I could do it if challenged. Um, but what's pretty about this is that you can take, for example, you can take this integral here and rewrite it. You see... Omega is related to 1 over df dx. And, oh dear. This is best left alone. Um, okay. Or at least keep away from the, the arrow buttons. Um, okay, you can turn this integral into something that involves the, the uh, delta function here. Okay, and then those who understand delta functions will know, of course, that if you integrate the delta of f, then that involves a 1 over df dx when you change the uh, change variables. Okay, theta here is the height is the height as defined. Theta is a step function or a characteristic function that restricts x's to height less than one. Okay, so you're actually restricting to the unit cube here if you deal in x. Okay, so that's just a statement of integration that this is equal to that. Okay, and uh, there's a similar integral that the p-adic integral, it's a very pretty thing, that the piadic integral is given by a corresponding integral over here, okay, which has precisely the same form. So, so far we've got this, this product here that says that the real period times this product of CPNP over P is this integral here, right, which is the sort of thing that warms the heart of a physicist, right? It, you can't stop yourself thinking of this as a functional integral. Okay. So we're now integrating over an x. Which is an Adele, or really a, a, what we call a path. It's really a triple of Adele's, like this. And so that gives a nice representation of the, of the product. 
Okay. And, sorry, one of the cultural differences between physicists and mathematicians is that we always write the D3x. Well, firstly, we write D3x, meaning D3x means dx1, dx2, dx3. I apologize if that's trivial, but I've had people refuse to, 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 to participate further in the talk because they didn't like that. Um, and uh, the other thing that happens is that physicists tend to write the integration. First, right, integration is an operation like differentiation, so it's considered to be good taste to write the dx first. Okay. Okay, so that's defined everything, and uh, all this can be defined, and if you don't like, I mean, so the difference between physicists and mathematicians, as I've said, is that physicists like to throw around delta functions. Um, all this is, all these delta functions are implicit in Tate's thesis, except that there it's all expressed in terms of Fourier transforms, but it's all the same. Right. Okay, then there's a, a, a very pretty thing that plays a role in what goes on, which is a, a duality between the Vey Chatelet group, that's the group of these inequivalent elliptic curves, and the elliptic curves. So there's a bilinear product for over QP for each P, and there's a similar bilinear product over the reals, except over the reals it's not non degenerate, it's non degenerate up here which takes an element of the Vey chatelet group and gives you a product against the points of the elliptic curve. And we'll want to do this integral, right? We did this integral before and that gave us the, the real period. Now we're going to embellish it with this e to the 2 pi i psi x psi is an element of the Vey chatelet group. And similarly, the corresponding thing over the p addicts. And that's rather, that's an easy integral to do. It's done by the usual trick, right? So you take the integral of the norm of omega e to the 2 pi i psi x, like that. Um, this in a product respects the additivity property of the group, so you can shift variables x plus x twiddle without changing the value of the integral, and it's bilinear, so this comes outside as e to the 2 pi i psi x twiddle integral omega e to the 2 pi i psi x. And so the integral is going to be 0 the integral is going to be 0 unless this factor is 1 and this since the inner product is non-degenerate this factor is 1 only if psi is 0. So it's 1 for every x, only if psi is 0. So, and if psi is 0, then we come back to the integral we had before. So you see that this integral is just the, over the reals, this gives you the real period times delta psi, where delta psi simply means 1 if psi is 0 and 0 otherwise. <coughs> and you have the same statement over the piadics for every p, like this. And so, what we have here is an integral, consider this integral now, the integral d3x, h of x, the theta function. If you like, theta just restricts you to the uh, integrating over the piadic integers. Um, e to the 2 pi i psi x. Psi is an Adele made of these uh, of these psi's, uh, delta of f of x. So consider this integral, and we sum over all psi's in the Vey Chatelet group. Then do the x integral first, 
we, get, we use these results here, so you get pi infinity, this, this factor, and then you get this sum over the deltas. And so you get a non-zero contribution to the sum only if psi infinity is zero and psi p is zero for every p. And the elements of the Weiss-Châtelet group for which that is true are precisely the elements of Sha. Okay, so this gives us the order of Sha times pi infinity times p less than m, this cp n p over p. So this is what we've done is what I've shown you is that you take this integral, right, which uh, has the form of a path integral, and you just do it, and it gives you the, whichever side of the conjecture this was, right? I forget whether it was left or right. Okay, so... Um, so, there you have the Sure. Uh, probably... Okay, so if psi is not infinite, then this integral is infinite. I mean, see, if psi is not finite, then this integral is infinite. Okay? Uh, what I'm saying is that those two are equal. Okay? Okay. So, um... Look, it's a nice integral. Right? I mean, that's good. That's good. Okay. So... I said this was a path integral, right? I mean, in physics, you're always, physics is always about you're integrating integral d phi e to the i s of phi, right? So it's all about integrals like that. And um, in fact, in topological field theories, you might well have an s of a special form. So you might have an integral d phi, integral d lambda e to the 2 pi i lambda f of phi by, I don't know why I'm calling it phi, I should call it x, right, f of x, and you do the lambda integral and this gives you integral dx, integral dx, delta of f of x, right, and that's precisely what we've got. And we could have written this as, we could have written this integral as that by using the usual exponential representation of the delta function. Okay, so you do integrals like this and, for example, one of such integral is in string theory. You could have a P1, a world sheet, and you could have a kalabi L manifold and you could map the P1 into the kalabi L manifold and you might have a path integral where you sum over, you integrate over all possible maps to do this, right? So this is the sort of thing that you have to do, the integral you have to do. And in good situations where you have enough supersymmetry, you can say that you have a path integral to do, but the integral is going to be dominated by the paths of steepest descent. And so the paths of steepest descents are the holomorphic maps, and in this way you show that the path integral you're trying to evaluate is the sum over holomorphic paths, right? Holomorphic maps, and in this way you get a formula for the number of, of uh, rational curves of each degree and so on. Um, so in the, 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 the point about this is that in good situations, you can compute these path integrals and you get a sum over, over the stationary points of the action. And you might, in some, if you're very lucky, you might even get an, uh, a situation where that sum is not just an asymptotic approximation, but might actually be an exact, an exact evaluation. Now, we're not probably going to be in that situation, but nevertheless, you might hope that <coughs> there are paths that dominate. So what would these paths be? Well, the natural thing to think of would be that among the Adels, or the principal Adels, 
and there are these are the Adels that all de descend from rational, uh, rational points. Okay, so if, if R is rational, then R is real, and it's in QP for every P, so the, the Adele that looks like that is an Adele, and these are the principal Adels. And so this is what's illustrated there. So you might have thought that those would be the paths that dominate. Now I'm going to change tack now, and I'm going to actually try and evaluate the, the path integral. And again, the most surprising thing was, so this would be good, right? I mean, this would give you an intuition as to why the rational numbers come into the game. Right? That you have an integral over all Adele's, but it would be the rational Adele's that would dominate, perhaps. Okay. Now, the puzzling thing is, of course, that that isn't quite right, because the puzzling thing is not that, is that the, what you're counting are not the rational points, but the rational points squared. Right? So we have to see how that arises. And I say from the outset that I can't, we can't finish the analysis. Okay. But it's, it, it, it's remarkable, actually, that although I'm using the language of physics, that mathematicians already had a language for this. I mean, you know, I say path, and mathematicians say to Dells. Um, and we say, um, we say, you know, you're going to approximate by the points, by the paths of steepest descents, and that already has a name. It's the Hardy-Littlewood method. Right. So, let's uh, carry on. Okay, so here we have it. We want to, uh, let, let's just think of this product here. Forget about the real bits for the moment. The, the product over the MPs, we have a certain integral to do, um, which is restricted, which is integrated over the, uh, over the Adels. We can think of the, just the finite Adels, and so you've got an integral over addict numbers, so Q hat are the addict numbers. Okay. And um, given an addict number eta, then we made a, a remark somewhere over here, Given an addict number, you can write it uniquely as a rational number plus an addict integer. So you do that. Okay. And so you write the rational number as S over Q, where S is prime to Q. And Z in this formula is an addict integer. Okay. And there's an addict delta function. So I shouldn't point, I should use this. There's an addict delta function, which you can write this way. Okay, the usual way. It's true over addict numbers also. And you can expand out using this. You can expand out as a sum over all rational numbers S over Q times e to the 2 pi i S f of x. And what's done here is to notice that we've written x so write x as s over q plus z, where z is a, an addict integer. The coefficients in f were integers, remember? And so f of x is f of s over q. Is, no, sorry, 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 sorry. Eta is this e to the 2 pi i eta f of x is e to the 2 pi i s over q f of x because putting an integer here makes no difference because f is an integer and you have e to the 2 pi i. Okay. And the only thing that might worry you, that's certainly true if z is finite, if z is a an infinite integer, if z is, is an addict integer, then it's still true because we can think of a, finite, a sequence of finite integers that approximate to z, and it's true for each of them. 
Okay, so that's, uh, that's actually true. Okay, so you have this uh, interesting representation of a delta function. You can write this this way. Uh, you can make sense of a sum over all the rational numbers by making a, an airy uh, expansion. It hasn't appeared, so we're not putting it in. We could put it in, okay, but we're going to change gears a bit and just see how far we can go and uh, not worry about it, okay? Okay, so then the standard but key observation that this quantity that we have, we have an e to each term, we, 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 e to the 2 pi s over q f of x, that, um, and so, sorry, I'm using, it was said in the previous talk that there were too many q's and there are too many q's here, and q here is just an integer. Okay. Um, there are too many q's, but uh, this sum that you have to do, this sum, that you have to do is periodic in x, right? Because if you, if you, this is where the periodicity comes in, if you write f of x plus nq, then uh, because the coefficients in n are, inter in f are integers, this in fact is f of x plus an integer. Okay, is it, well, more than that, is f of x plus a multiple of q. So, in fact, this, this sum here is periodic in X with period Q. Okay. And since that's true, then you can't help yourself but expand in a Fourier series. Okay. So, you expand in a Fourier series, and this means we sum over all M's uh, in the range 0 to Q minus 1. Okay. And the coefficient in here, sq of m, is of course given by the inverse Fourier transform, which is this business. Okay. But you see a pretty thing happens at this stage, that we started with an x, and now we have a Fourier transform variable, which is an m, and the, this quantity is defined by the inverse Fourier transform, so you have a y, which is logically independent for x, right? So you get a story with an x, a y, and an m. Yeah, three minutes, okay. So I could say that we have a wonderful proof of the bert swinnerton dyer conjecture, but three minutes is not enough time to finish it off. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that, that's exactly right, right. Um, okay, so you have a sum to do, okay, and it's a story about an X, a Y, and an M, and you remember that we said that the most puzzling thing about this was that there should be, you should count the square of the rational number of rational points. And this, I believe this is where it comes in. That you end up with a pair of points, X and Y. And M is a line, right? You can see that M is a line, right? Okay, M dot Y here is clearly a line. It's a linear function of Y. Um, so what you, what you hope to do is end up counting M's, counting numbers of rational lines, okay? And uh, you can show that, so, so far, everything's exact. Actually, no approximations have been made at all, okay? Um, you can go on, you can show that the sum now, you do make an approximation, you can show that the sum is dominated by the square full integers, um, Q of the form Q1 squared Q2, and this is as far as we've got, that if you, if you do this, then you show that by integrating out, essentially uh, uh, integrating out over the Q1, so this is also something that's very pretty. You can show that uh, 
that, 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 that you can sort of uh, do some of the sums, and that when you do that, that it concentrates, the sum concentrates on pairs of points y and x and lines that join them. Okay. So, were it not for the fact that we proved things mod Q rather than prove things absolutely, I would, I would say that this was a proof. But it's not a proof because we still have to, you still have to find a way of going from a result mod Q to a result over the, uh, over, uh, 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 over the reals. Okay, so that's the story. Thank you. Any questions?